Well, I want to welcome you to Mountain View Church. Welcome this morning, and I just had one announcement real quick. Uh, I'm not going to make everybody get up and greet each other again, but we'll do that in the future. But uh, after this service, I've got about a 30-minute training that uh, we'd like anybody who's interested in the welcome ministry and the sanctuary ministry to come to that right afterwards. And I promise we won't uh, make your stomach growl for too long, okay, just for a little bit. Okay, so thank you. Good morning. My name is Nancy, and I'm involved in a couple of things here at Mountain View, and one of them is Children's Church. So I just wanted to kind of spotlight that ministry today. So <laughs> um, it is offered during the second service, and we have a class for three, four, and five-year-olds, and then we also have another class for first, second, and third graders. The children... Hopefully they'll be showing up there in a minute. <laughs> the children enjoy a snack, songs, a Bible story, and activities to help them learn the Bible theme or lesson for the day. The younger children have been learning about Zacchaeus and Jesus' miracles, and in the coming weeks we'll learn about Paul and Silas. The older kids who are up there on the right, even though a few of them weren't there that day, I took pictures, um, have been learning about the Ten Commandments, the parables, and in the coming weeks we'll learn about the 23rd Psalm. When I asked some of the kids what they love about Children's Church, they said they love learning Bible stories and about God. One mom told me that her son wanted to come to church with her just so that she, he could go to Children's Church. So that was a kind of a cool story. Um, I also want to just tell you about some of our amazing teachers that we have teaching Children's Church. Um, they are faithfully preparing and teaching a lesson once a month for our kiddos. The ones up on the top, Riley, Miranda, and Katie, teach our younger kids. And the ones on the bottom, Brandy, Angie, and Dennis and Denise, teach our older kids. I'm super grateful for each of them. Um, their commitment to our kids and our church is really neat, and they're helping our children just learn to love and know Jesus better. Um, we are missing two spots up there, though. We have room for eight teachers, and so we have a need for two more. So if you love Jesus and you love kids and you'd love to help in this ministry, I'd love to talk to you. It's just a once a month commitment for about an hour. Um, so let me know if you're interested. And I also have one more thing to tell you about, and that is the newcomer lunch. So that is two weeks from today. And I would just like to invite anybody here that is new to Mountain View, whether it's been in the last year or even more than that, but you haven't had a chance to come to our lunch, we would love to have you join us. Um, it's after the second service, so around 11.30, and it's just a good chance you can hear from Pastor Bruce and Pastor Mike and from others in our church that are involved in different ministries, and you can also get to know some new people that are new to the church as well. So if you would like to come, we'd love to have you. Um, just I'll be in the back there after the service. You can let me know, or you could call the church office as well. So thank you for your time, and appreciate you guys. I am so appreciative of those who uh, serve not only outside the walls of the place of worship where we gather, but also inside the, the church building, the facility. I'm grateful for Matt and his willingness to head up our uh, hospitality ministry and give that some more uh, intentional direction. I'm so grateful for uh, what Nancy has done over the last years in serving as our children's church coordinator for those, the team that she has around her, and also as the coordinator for our newcomers luncheon. And uh, it's God's people who make the church. It isn't just those that you always see up here week after week on, the, on a Sunday. And so I'm gr so grateful for those who have made Mountain View what it is. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Josh and Lacey Presley to come up to the front. And any elders who happen to be here in this service with us, if you could gather around us as well. Josh and Lacey are our newest members. I'm going to have them affirm what I know they can affirm. They have Josh Jr. and Riley with them who aren't becoming members, but they're with mom and dad. And uh, we're glad to have them. You don't become automatically a member of Mountain View because your parents are members. Uh, just because we, just like we don't become a member of God families, God's family because our parents were Christians, uh, it's an intentional decision for membership at Mountain View. And uh, I'm so grateful for Josh and Lacey, and you probably recognize him especially because he's been up front helping to lead worship at times. 
uh, they have plugged in and are serving already with us at Mountain View. But I'd like them to affirm three things. Do you confess, most importantly, do you confess faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Mm -hmm. Riley's saying yes, too. <laughs> do you declare your intention to live in harmony with our EFCA statement of faith? And do you agree to support this congregation through the use of your talents and abilities as God leads you by your prayers for its leadership and for one another, faithful involvement in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the body of Christ again and uh, for Josh and Lacey and their desire to uh, not only worship with us but to become members and become more intimately involved in the life of the church. May you use them to encourage us as we seek to encourage them in their faith, in their walk, in their growth uh, through Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to stand with us this morning as we spend some time worshiping God through song. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. There's empty praise, the treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. Oh, 
dismiss children to go to children's church. You know, we just sang that song declaring that God's the only one who can do certain things. And at times we look at life, we look at our life, we look at the world around us and we, we throw our hands up in despair because there's just stuff going on that we know we can't handle. There's stuff going on we know we can't control. Things in our own life Things flaring up in the Middle East have people concerned. There's a lot going on at times. Psalm 46.10 tells us to be still and know that He is God. And at times we get so worked up and spend so much time worrying and trying and striving on our own to fix things, and we can't. And the thing we need to do is to stop and to let go and to be still and trust that he is God and he's going to do what he's going to do. And one of the ways we do that is by focusing again on who God is, spending time worshiping him and declaring the truth about how awesome and great he is. He's big enough and smart enough and strong enough for whatever we face in life. Let's do that together. The splendor of the King Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age. 
Team. Thank you, congregation. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing grace of yours. Grace that is greater than all of my sin. Grace that is greater than all of our sin. Grace that can remove the fear of what we righteously deserve, punishment for our sin, when we come to you by your grace, your faith in Jesus Christ, grace that is great enough to lighten up the fears that we might have living in this world of ours so full of things that we have no control over. I do pray for peace in the Middle East and in Ukraine, places, other places around the world where terrorists and other groups seek to wreak havoc on the lives of others in the pursuit of power, in the pursuit of land, in the pursuit of resources. I pray, O oh God, that you will steer, providentially steer those who are the decision makers in countries around the world towards peace. We know that in the absence of your return, O oh Lord, that there will be no lasting peace, but we do pray that you will protect the innocent. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I pray that as we look at it today once again, that we will look at it not as the words of man, but as your divinely inspired word that is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, not just historical facts, but teaching that is intended to show us how we might learn from others, and what you desire from us today. I pray that you will take your word and open, soften hearts, open minds, that we might receive it and understand it today, that we might go from this place in a little bit desiring and leaning on your power to put it into practice. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever heard or thought or asked the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Has that ever crossed your mind? Why do bad things happen to good people? I remember asking that question as a child we had a set of grandparents who were gracious enough to, when we got to a certain age, to take two of us, myself and my siblings, two at a time for a week during the summer. They would come across the state line and pick us up and bring us to their place outside of Rochester, Minnesota. And uh, we would spend a week with them. One summer, when we got there, we learned that their sweet elderly neighbors had been killed in a car crash, hit by a drunk driver. They lost their lives, and from what we were told, he walked away with maybe scratches. It's the first time it occurred to me, that question, why do bad things happen to good people, and why do sometimes the bad people seem to get off scot-free? I asked that question about myself later in life as a teenager. I, I got to a point where I was asking myself once in a while, God, why did you have me be born into a family with an alcoholic and abu physically abusive father? And that question resurfaced when 
My mom remarried, and my new stepfather was also physically abusive. God, why do you allow bad things to happen to good people, to sweet elderly people, to children? The Bible verses we're going to focus on today, and Lord willing, the ones that we will focus on next week as well, touch on this issue of God's fairness, his judgment, his righteousness, and his mercy. Today's scripture will take us back to Abraham, Old Testament times, an encounter that Abraham had with the Lord. If you were with us last Sunday, we looked at how the Lord appeared in the form of a man along with two angels also in the form of men. They appeared to Abraham. They showed up outside of his tent where he had been living for some time now near the oaks of Mamre. And that place was located, as you see on the map here, some 20 plus miles south of Jerusalem. It was near Hebron or Hebron today, that area is under Palestinian control. Jerusalem is under mixed control. But this is where this encounter with the Lord and these two angels in the form of men took place. Those visitors had come to Abraham's tent for the express purpose of sharing a message. It is a message that the Lord had already shared with Abraham, but he hadn't shared it to Abraham at a place where Abraham's wife was able to hear it. And from what we saw last week, it seems that Abraham hadn't really passed the message along to his wife for whatever reason. And the message was that by this time next year, the Lord will revisit Abraham and Sarah, and she will have conceived and will have given birth and will have a son the son of promise. And we know from last week that Sarah did what her husband had done before when he first heard this promise, laughed within herself. Because here they are. She's 90 and he's 100. The way of women is past for her. This does not happen. And so she laughed and the Lord called her on it and said, why did Sarah, who's inside the tent listening, laugh? And she did what so many of us do when we get caught red-handed lying or or doing something we shouldn't do, we lie again. And she said, no, I didn't laugh. And the Lord said, yes, but you did laugh. But God affirmed once again this promise that the son of promise to Abraham would not be Ishmael, his son by his Egyptian, the Egyptian handmaid of his wife. It would be his own son through his wife, Sarah. Well, with their mission accomplished, now the the Lord and the other two men, angels, are going to take leave of Abraham. We pick up the account with what we read in Genesis 18, verse 16. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Look at there. Reading from the ESV translation, we're told this. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. Abraham did what was common courtesy in that day and age among those people. When you had visitors, you didn't just say, wave them goodbye from the door of your tent. You often went with them a certain distance, sometimes a relatively short distance, sometimes a longer distance. In this case, I suspect it's at least a couple miles that he goes with them because of where they end up. They go to a place as we read in the text here, where they can look down towards Sodom. They are to the west of the Dead Sea, and they go to where they can look down to Sodom, if we can see the map here. I've zeroed in a little bit, focused in on the map, and there you have Hebron or Hebron with Mamre actually noted on this map, and the Dead Sea is off about 20 miles to the east, and if you don't think you can see 20 miles, well, just when you leave here today, go out by the highway and look Long's Peak. It's way more than 20 miles. And what they did is they went to a place where they could look down and see. It's a place that is today along this ridge, perhaps, that I've tried to highlight there 
Uh, somewhere along there is where they walked to and where they are now situated. It's a place that, is, that today is known as either, it goes by a couple different names, Bani Naim or Kafar Bahruka. Um, there are locations along that ridge where you can look down, for, and it's at a height of about 3,000 plus feet, and the Dead Sea is more than 1,000 feet below sea level. But there are places where you can look down through the, the valleys and see towards the Dead Sea off in the distance. They're at one of these places where they can, from this ridge, pretty close to Hebron and Mamre, where they can look down towards the Dead Sea and the cities that are located there. Sodom was more than just another city. Sodom was a place that had a special place in the heart of Abraham because it is the location where his nephew Lot had moved and where Lot lived with his family. And, and we know that Abraham had a special place in his heart for Lot and his family from things that we read in Scripture. Go with me, first of all, if you will, to Genesis 13. Genesis 13, 5 through 13. These verses tell us how they ended up where they were living at this period of time. Genesis 13, beginning at verse 5. And Lot, who went with Abraham, and to give you some background, he went with Abraham to Egypt, where they sojourned, where they stayed for a period of time, and, and now they have returned to the land of promise. And Lot, who went with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. Spoiler alert, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. That describes them when he moved there, when Lot pitched his tent in that direction. But given the first choice, think about it, if we, if we have some cake or pie or something and we cut it up into pieces and we give our kids first choice, we have to be careful to cut those pieces exactly the same, which is impossible, because first choice means biggest. No different here with Lot. He's given first choice. And given first choice, he looks to the east and he, he sees a land that is a whole lot better looking than where he has been living with Abram, who will soon be renamed Abraham. And, and so he chooses the land towards the Jordan Valley and he moves there with his family, initially pitching his tent outside of Sodom, but then, as we're going to come to understand, eventually moving into a house within the, the city within the walls of the city. But we're told those people living there were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Well, despite being separated from Lot by some 20, perhaps 30 miles at this point in time, Abraham still had this affinity, this love for his nephew Lot. And that shows itself in what happens is recorded in the next chapter. If you'll turn with me, to Genesis 14, beginning at verse 8. Genesis 14, beginning at verse 8. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, 
went out and they joined battle in the valley of Siddim with Ketoleomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphael, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elasar. Four kings against five. This map here shows you. This is no little petty squabble amongst a few people who live around the Dead Sea. These kings who came united against the people living in that region came from as far away as Babylon area, the land of Shinar, and up there by the Euphrates. This is somewhat of a regional battle. Some kings allied themselves and they made their way down by the Dead Sea and they attacked the people living there. And, and then we go on and read what happens. Now the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. As they fled, some fell into them and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went on their way. They headed north. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and went on their way. So Lot has now been captured by an enemy, and they're heading northward away from the Dead Sea with him and, and others, as we're going to learn. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eschol and of Aner. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan, that's in northern Israel. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobach, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. It hasn't been so long since Abram had risked his life and his wealth in pursuing an enemy that had captured his nephew Lot. He cared that much about Lot and his family that he had taken his 318 trained men and pursued the enemy and won the victory and brought them back along with the people who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah benefited from Abram's concern and his love for his nephew Lot. But we know the wickedness of the people did not abate. It did not cease. It continued. It continued. And God is about to bring judgment on the people living in the cities around the Dead Sea there. Knowing that Abraham had this love for his nephew, that he had a vested interest along with some other things we're going to read, God decides it's time to share what I'm thinking of doing to those cities with Abraham. Go with me back to Genesis 18, our main text. Genesis 18, verses 17 through 19, it tells us, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness, and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Back when God had called Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees and to go to a place that he would show him, which would end up being the promised land, God had made some promises during that period of time. And, and, and we find it, if you go with me just back to Genesis 12, 2 and 3, we read this promise that God had made. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. As we come back here to Genesis 18, verses 17 through 19, it's a reminder that God had chosen Abraham he had chosen Abraham to become a great and mighty nation. 
He had chosen Abraham to be the one from whom would come the one who would be the blessing to all the families of the earth, the promised Messiah. He had chosen him, Abraham, to lead his family in doing what was righteous and just. If Abraham is going to lead his family and those after him in doing what is just and righteous, Abraham needs to learn and communicate the truth that a just and holy and righteous God must punish sin. That failure to lead righteous and just lives comes at a cost. And so the Lord chooses to let Abraham know what he's planning to do with those cities. Verses 20 and 21. Genesis 18, 20 and 21. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. If not, I will know. If you remember back in chapter 13, verse 13, we had already been told that the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Hasn't changed. It's gotten worse, perhaps. And there are some people who have been crying out to Yahweh, to the Lord, about the sinfulness of those people. We are not told if those doing the crying out to God are people who are living within those cities or whether they are people who have traveled through that area or whether it's a combination of, the both, of both of those groups of people. We're only told that people have been crying out to God about the wickedness, the sinfulness of the people living in those cities. And God has heard their cry. And God knows everything. He doesn't need to go and see, but it's worded this way because it's anthropomorphism. It's a putting human traits as they relate to God. Basically, what God is saying is, I'm going to go down and verify. I'm going to verify whether these, these cries of the wickedness, the sinfulness of these people is current, whether it's happening right now. That's what he says. I will go down and see whether the wickedness of the people is as bad as the people are saying it is. Verses 22 through 26. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. At this point, the two men, whom we will very soon learn are really angels, continue eastward, as the text tells us, toward Sodom. But Abraham, we're told, still stood before the Lord. It's interesting. We are not told that the Lord has specifically told Abraham what he's going to do in response to the wickedness of those cities. But from what Abraham says, it's pretty clear that Abraham is aware that those cities not only are wicked, but that their wickedness deserves the punishment of God. Verse 23, look at it again. Then Abraham drew near and said, he's speaking to Yahweh God, the the man who is a representation of, of Yahweh God. Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? There are some, and I'm not going to argue with anybody about it, who who believe that Abraham was concerned about all the people living in those cities. And he may have been concerned about all of them. He may have been concerned about all the righteous people living in those cities. But I know for sure that he's primarily concerned about his nephew Lot and their family. We know that. Notice verse 24. Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? 
We don't know why he chooses 50 as his first number here. But he gives the number and he asks if, if the Lord, if he would really, really sweep away, destroy the city. He's not asking about the cities. He's asking about the city, which clues me in that he's really concerned about Sodom because that's where Lot lives. He's really concerned about that city. And he asks, would you really destroy that city, the city, for 50, if there's 50 righteous in it? Notice what it said next. Verse 25. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? It's clear from what Abraham says here that he is fully aware that this human-looking thing in front of him is really God, Yahweh. Because he, a representation of him, because he asked him, would you really do that? Would the judge of all the earth kill innocent people along with wicked people? Verse 26 told us, and the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. That's mercy. If there's just 50 righteous in the city, I'll spare everyone, even those wicked people. We're not told what Abraham was thinking at this point in time, but we, we are told what he says next. Perhaps as he reflected on it, it occurred to him, you know what? There might not be 50 righteous there. And God has agreed not to destroy them if there's 50 righteous, but maybe there aren't 50. Verses 27 and 28. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. First of all, Abraham is not presuming on God. He's not demanding from God. He, he's pleading with God. And he acknowledges that he's just a mere mortal, as he puts it, dust and ashes. But he re revises his request now. For whatever reason, maybe it's because it dawned on him there might not be 50 righteous. And so he asked, if just five of those 50 are missing, would you destroy it if there's 45 there? And the Lord answers with what we read there, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. But Abraham is not done. Notice what he says next as we go to verses 29 through 32. And he spoke again and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak again but this once Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. Some have called what Abraham was doing here as bargaining with the Lord. There's no bargaining taking place here. God isn't giving another number. He's just graciously saying each time Abraham gives a number, he graciously says, for that many, if that many righteous are in this city, I will not destroy it. No bargaining. Just God graciously saying, your prayer will be answered. Your prayer will be answered. As, as Abraham goes from 50 to 45 to 40 to 30 to 20 and all the way down to 10, that's God's response. If there are that many righteous people in the city, I will not destroy it for the sake of those 10 righteous people. So why did Abraham stop at 10? We don't know. It could be that he was thinking, you know, my nephew Lot is there, he's righteous. 
He's married to a woman. Surely she's righteous. We, knew, we know, we'll know from Scripture that they have at least two daughters living with them. That's four. We'll learn from Scripture that those two daughters are engaged to be married to men in the city. Surely they're righteous. That's six. There has to be at least four more righteous people in the city. It has to be. Maybe that's why he stopped at 10. But that's where he stopped. Is at 10. And as verse 32 tells us, for the sake of 10, God said, I will not destroy it. Genesis eighteen thirty three goes on to tell us, and the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. We're not told where the Lord went. He just went his way. We know that when it says that Abraham returned to his place, that would have been his tent by the Oaks of Mamre. And next week, Lord willing, we'll pick up the narrative there and review, be reminded of, learn what happened next. But for this week, the verses we've just considered, so many lessons to be learned, so many lessons to be reminded of. I'm reminded in Genesis 18, 19, that God desires his people keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. That is his desire for us who are his people, to be people who do righteousness and justice. We see in these verses that God is not ignorant of sin. He wasn't ignorant of the sins of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah and those other cities in the plain there by the Dead Sea. He is not ignorant of my sin, and he's not ignorant of your sin. He's fully aware of it. And we're also reminded in these verses that God is the judge of all the earth and that he's a righteous judge. And we know from other scripture that righteous judgment requires punishment for sin. And while we might not think that we're unrighteous, we might think that we're righteous, we're good people, because what do we often do? We compare ourselves to someone else that we know that's worse than us. I did that as a child. You know, I'm not as bad as my alcoholic, abusive father, so I'm good. I'm good with God. But at the age of 11, God used some scripture to convince me that I may not be like him and do the sins that he does, but I am a sinner. And one sin makes me guilty before God. A verse that was used to lead me to faith in Jesus is found in Romans, if you'll turn with me. Romans 3, 23. Romans 3, 23 the Apostle Paul wrote, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God spoke to me at the age of 11 and said that you too, Bruce. You're part of all. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Wars don't happen because God is unjust. Wars happen because people lust for power and wealth. They commit sin. Sweet elderly people aren't killed by drunk drivers because God is unjust. They are killed by drunk drivers because people choose to drink and drive. Sinful people choose to drink and drive. Children do not have abusive fathers because God is unjust. We have abusive fathers because there are some fathers who live in outright rebellion against God. Why do bad things happen to good people? Actually, they don't. Because there is none who is good. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As another scripture says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Bad things don't happen to good people because none of us really is good in God's eyes. But there's one way that we can be made righteous in his eyes. Scripture tells us that when God gave his promise to Abraham, Abraham believed God about the promise of a son, and it was counted to him, credited to him as righteousness. On this side of the cross, this side of 
the Messiah, the fulfillment of the promise being made, the one who would be a blessing to all families of the earth, the birth of Jesus and the life of Jesus who was tempted in every way yet was without sin. His sacrifice on the cross paid for my sin and it paid for your sin. And if we will believe what God tells us and put our faith in Jesus, we will receive that righteousness, his righteousness, not our righteousness. And so today the question is, do you know this righteousness? Despite your sins, can you say that when God looks at you by his grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, that he sees a righteous person because we have confessed our sins, believed what he says about Jesus, believed what Jesus said about himself, and come to faith in him? Do we know that we are right with God. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this reminder from it of, of your grand plan of salvation. I pray for any who might be here today who are outside of faith in Jesus, perhaps thinking that they're, they're okay with you, God, because they are pretty good in the eyes of others, and they aren't as bad as so many other people that they can think of. Convince them of what you convinced me of so many years ago, God, that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. You as the, the righteous judge of all the earth, you rightly should destroy me for my sin, but you choose not to. When you call people to yourself in saving faith in Jesus Christ, you forgive us. May you lead people to respond to you in confession of sin, in faith in Jesus. And then for those of us who have come to faith, may we go from this place today desiring and relying on your power, O oh God, to extend the same mercy and grace to others that you've extended to us, being willing to forgive those who have sinned against us, whether it's our own family members or our co-workers or our fellow students, our neighbor, being willing to begin with your help to try and live out our faith as followers of Jesus Christ, this side of the cross, I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us as we close one more song.
a meeting across the lobby in the chapel for those willing to help out with the welcoming ministry this week as you go go in God's strength and power share him with those around you we are dismissed